Hux, thanks for joining us. Um, just thought we'd, we'd start by the start of your Norwich career. Um, I think I'm right in saying at that time you were sort of, um, you were struggling to get into the Man City team and you've been bouncing between clubs for most of your career at this point. Um, what did you know about Norwich before you joined the club um, on loan at first? Uh, not much really, to be honest. Only, you know, playing a couple of times. You know, I used to, we used to do pretty well against Norwich. I, I scored against Forest against Norwich. I can remember playing for Man City against Norwich. So basically just, you know, the yellow kit always stands out, but it was really, you know, we used to do pretty well against Norwich. So that's what I remember more than anything. I didn't really particularly know how far it was from anywhere. I got to know that a bit later on. So only, only when I looked, when I was coming down to on loan, I realised that it was like five hours from Manchester. So Did that cause a problem for you? Did you reconsider because of that at any point? Caused a problem for my wife. <laughs> leaving her but uh, now like I say I, as soon as I agreed to do something you know I don't, the, the initial loan was just for me to go and get some games and get some game time so you know I didn't really realise what was coming at, at the time so it would just get down there and start playing a bit of football Yeah Was there ever a point during that initial loan spell where you kind of really had in your mind that Norwich might be a suitable option on a permanent basis or was it kind of like look I'm enjoying my time but I'll just get back to Man, Man City and see what happens was there ever a time where it was kind of nailed on at all uh, I don't think it was ever nailed on I think literally after two or three games and I just kind of got this sense that I was kind of meant to be here it's really weird you know normally it takes you especially on loan you don't know what's going to happen but literally after two or three games I just kind of got, I got a sense that you know the fans talked to me straight away you're winning games, you're playing. And I just thought, well, you know, this is kind of working out pretty well. That was, you know, after two or three games. So, and it kind of snowballed from there, really. Fair enough. I think um, when I was reading your book to prepare for this, um, and I read an amazing story, I thought, um, from the, when you were on loan, I think it was in November 2003, um, against Crew Alexandra. Uh, we won 1-0 and you scored the winner. But I think there was a bit more of a, a story behind that. Would you mind... Um, talking about that for people who, who don't know. Yeah, my, my one of my lads kind of, I don't know, just kind of went all floppy. And it was, I think he was only about three or four at a time. Just went all floppy. Didn't know what to do. You know, he wasn't responsive, couldn't talk, couldn't do anything. So, uh, you know, I rang up Robert and said, what do I do here? And said, you know, get him to the hospital. So we took him to the hospital. And then I went and played the game. So <laughs> I knew he was in good hands. Managed to score on that day. I had a little bit of goal drop before that, so I actually scored on that. Scored the winner on that day. I think we beat Crew one 0 Do you think that everything was that was going on? Did that sort of obviously, when you're in a goal drought, the sort of pressure builds up, and with every game it gets more difficult. Do you think what was going on actually almost took your mind off it a little bit and took the pressure off the football? Uh, not really. I think as soon as you, as soon as the game starts, that's the only thing that matters. It sounds daft. I know you've got your kids and misses and that, but you know you're you're in that moment and you're there to to do a job and you know we was on a good run at the time and you'd wanted to keep that going so to get the goal and it was a nice little finish as well I think I think Gary Holt knocked it down to me called it in the bottom corner so and, he, and I knew by then that it was okay so it was like just you know crack on and play and get right. the three points and then get him home after yeah obviously you then signed um, permanently and there was all the you know it's well documented how things unfolded there um, we got promoted um, did you feel like at that point that was sort of what you'd been hoping to get to for the whole of your career? Because obviously, like we said, you're a bit of a sort of journeyman up to that point, and then all of a sudden you were the star man in now a Premier League team. Did you feel like that was sort of the that you'd reached where you wanted to get to, or was there even more that you wanted to achieve? Uh, I don't know. I can't. I can't believe you just journeyed me off there straight away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I, I was. You know, I look at I like different spells through my career. You know, I was really successful at Coventry. You know, at the time, myself and Dion Dublin was one of the most feared strike partnerships in the Premier League. You know, the, at the same time, Dion Dublin was winning the Golden Boot when I was alongside him. So I had a, a good spell there. You know, I had a good spell at Leeds. You know, in a in a great in a great squad that was playing in the Europa semi-finals and then Champions League. So that was pretty good. And then I went to Man City and we won the league at Man City. So. I kind of like four four portions of my career where you know things are going pretty well, and you know to get to to Norwich, still only twenty seven, having played you know for all them clubs, 
I had bounced around a little bit, so it was probably a time for me to settle down and, you know, not just... Cause it's dead easy if you want to, to move and play and move for the money and stuff like that. So I just, I needed to settle down and, you know, leave a little bit of a legacy. Even saying that, even though I'm, you know, I'm well regarded at Man City, I'm still well regarded at Coventry. So I've been pretty lucky really with my career that every place I've played, I think the fans have really appreciated me. You mentioned there being part of a, a strike partnership with Dion Dublin. Obviously earlier in your career um, for Coventry and stuff, you were, more of a sort of traditional um, through the middle type player. At Norwich, you're obviously better known for for being a winger and playing out wide. Did you? Where did that? How did that sort of conversation happen? And, and who is that with? Where you decided to to move that? To be honest with you, I never particularly liked playing up front, especially when I got. You know, obviously with Dion, it was it was a little bit easier, but I think my game the amount of, you know, the way I played, the way I beat people, the way I created chances. I'd never thought I was an out-and-out centre-forward. So, you know, back then, a lot of teams played 4-4-2, so you was either up front or you was on the left wing. Nowadays, everyone plays 4-3-3, which I think would have suited me even better because playing as a, as a wide attacker, because that's what I really was. I thought it was, I was a wide attacker more than a centre-forward. So, excuse me, I was... I, I just drifted to the left anyway. Even when I played up front, I drifted to the left. So it's really a natural progression for me. And, and to be honest with you, it was centre forward's a tough gig. You know, the, the pressure is to score goals week in, week out. And I think I did a lot of my best work was setting people up. So it was I think it was a natural progression for me to go and play on the left. In terms of that season, um, when we were in the Premier League, from a not not just a personal standpoint, but from a collective standpoint, obviously what the team was like that year. Do you have any like personal memories from that year which you look back on? And even now, you know, I mean, for you know, for one, I look back at the goal you scored um, against Arsenal. You know, I mean, that gets replayed, you know, every now and now, now and again as well for just being such a fantastic goal. Was there any other moments throughout that season which you look back on and think, "Wow, I can't believe I did that"? Uh, I think collectively, uh, collectively, I thought you know, beating Man United at home was a was a yeah. big day. Uh, there's lots of good games in that in that season. The biggest thing I come out of that season was a, a bit of regret, really, because you know it's well, well docu- documented that if we'd have signed Dean Ashton at the start of the season instead of January, we'd have stayed up comfortably. And I think our first 13 games, we drew eight, which you know it sounds sounds like we struggled a little bit, but you know you turn two or three of them eight draws into wins, and we stay up by ten points. So. Now, it's a shame we didn't sign Dean Ashton because we needed a centre forward. We needed an out and out centre forward, and the thing is, we didn't want to, you know, we didn't want to spend the money when we needed to. And then, when we did want to spend the money, it was too late in January. So, you know, it's a shame really because you get these chances to stay in the Premier League and build on it, and you know, we didn't really, we didn't really take that chance. You know, you took the, the next question right out of my mouth because it. My next question was looking back, what what maybe could have changed, what was maybe a, a factors which could have helped us stay up that year. But I think, to be honest with you, you've probably just nailed on an answer for that. I suppose you know, was there any other? Yeah, but even after, I think that you look at games in that in that space. Obviously, everyone remembers the six 0 at Fulham at the end, but that obviously that didn't go where we wanted it to. But there was a lot of things around that that kind of killed us. Uh, obviously, players probably wanting to leave. Steve Foley had a like a mini heart attack before the game started. One of our coaches, and then we were chasing the game. But you know, that, obviously, that was devastating. But what really killed us was when we played uh, Crystal Palace and we're three-one up with about fifteen minutes to go, and I think we gave away two penalties right near the end. I think David was it. Andy Johnson scored scored two penalties. And I think that was the one that killed us because if we'd have won that game. I do believe we would have stayed up. So I think everyone thinks about the Fulham game, but it was really to be 3 1 up away at Crystal Palace that I think it was our, was our downfall. So obviously, after that, you uh, you get relegated and eventually um, Worthington leaves. I know you had quite a good relationship with him. Um, when did you, what was the, the first sort of thing you heard about him leaving and how did it make you feel? Well, obviously, it wasn't great, but. Actually, I got uh, stop. We started that season really well. We were second. I think we we beat uh, Barnsley five one. 
and we were second in the table and that was just as the international break came along and I, I got a little pull in my thigh and I didn't really play properly again until the, the game he got sacked. So... That what's mean? that like? What's that? What's that pressure like when you know when you all like the the manager? Which I think, from what I've heard, you all, he seemed to get on with the group well. What's that like playing under that pressure, feeling like if we lose this game, you know, our, our boss who we really like might get might get the sack? Yeah, that's, it's not great. You know, like I, said, I probably wasn't even fully fit when I played in that last game again. I think it was against Burnley. I think might have been Burnley. Yeah, we got beat, but you know, the only reason I played was because I wanted to try and save. Nigel's job, you know, and everyone had respect for Nigel. He wasn't like, as as we'll probably find out later on in this conversation, that you know, some some sometimes managers just don't get on with the players. But everyone had a lot of respect for Nigel, and you know, it was a shame when he went. But sometimes that's what happens in football. It's you know, we we when you do well when you get in the Premier League, there's an expectation that probably wasn't there before we went up. You know, before we got into the Premier League, I think it was nine years in the Championship. We never really, I know you got to the playoffs, but never really looking like you were going to go up. So as soon as you do go up, the expectation changes. Mm-hmm. And I think we've had that expectation ever since, to be honest with you, where you, know, you, you strive to get to the Premier League. Yeah, obviously, I think something I wanted to talk to you about was uh, later down the line, Peter Grant gets um, hired as the manager and the reception from the fans was quite confused really he hadn't um, done that much in management before he arrived but watching your um, All in Yellow podcast a few weeks ago you you seem to be you seem to think he was a, a pretty decent coach did you was there almost like a, a, a split in the dressing room when he was when he arrived or does that as players do you need to do you not pay attention to the sort of media reaction do you just wait and see what he's like when he gets to the training ground yeah, you, you don't know who's coming in. So you just basically you're waiting to see what see what happens. Uh, Peter Grant, an exceptional coach. You know, I, I don't think he was probably cut out to be a manager, especially taking that job straight away was very difficult. But an exceptional coach, he knew his football, great bloke as well, loads of integrity. But I just think it was probably a job too soon. I don't, you know, I don't think he's really been in management since since that job. So I th- he's a great first team coach. And I think that that's where his uh, skill set lies. Did you feel like maybe he could have been, because of that coaching ability, do you think he could have been maybe kept on at the club in a similar way to, say, Neil Adams was a, a few years ago, in that he could have stayed at the club and, and still offered something? No, nah, I think it's when you've when you've got that, when you've had that job, the manager's job, I, I think it's very difficult to step back and do something, something else. You can't, I don't think you can go from being the top man to a number two and carry on with it, I don't think so. Like I said, he's gone into have a great career. He's gone and coached all over the place. And he's, you know, he's, uh, he's like I said, I still speak to him every, t- every time I see him. I still have stand and have a chat with him. You know, he's, he's a good bloke. And he's, you know, like I say, he's got a lot of integrity and a lot of managers haven't. So, fair play to him. Was it, when, when you came back as a, a coach and, and later an ambassador and stuff, was it harder, was it hard for you, um, was it hard for them to get you back because of what had happened? Did that, sort of weigh in your mind when you're deciding whether to, to come back in a different role? No, not at all. Uh, the, day, the day they let me go, I went and bought uh, three season tickets for me and my, my boys to come and watch. So basically, even when I was in America, I had three season tickets there waiting for me to come back and waiting for the summer, waiting for the obviously the Christmas period in the MLS, you end up finishing. So yeah, like, for, for me, I was just happy to be part of the club. You know, I always said that, you know, this is my home now. Norwich is my club, even though I play for a lot of clubs and well regarded in other places. This is my home, this is my club. And, you know, it was an honour to coach and see some of the young lads coming through. It was an honour to be an ambassador. So, you know, if I'm associated to, for, to, with Norwich to the day I die, then I think I've done something right. Just a uh, final one for me and then I'll let uh, Alfie talk for a little bit. But, um, <laughs> You, you mentioned earlier Dion Dublin and the fact that you two were the, the sort of senior figures in the in the dressing room. Um, did you, obviously he, he came back towards the end of his career um, and you two played together at Coventry. Did you have any hand in him coming back to Norwich? Uh, not really. Nigel did come and ask me, what do you think of Dion coming back? And I was like, well, he's like 37. So I'm thinking, I'm, I'm not sure if that's you know, the actual answer. But it's funny because obviously I played it. When I was young, like coming through, 
I played with Dion at Coventry. And then I was one of the older players at Norwich. And Dion was one of the older granddad players. At, so it was really weird how we still, you know, we started off kind of together and we kind of finished together. Because, you know, Dion's last ever game was my last ever game for Norwich. So it's kind of like, even though I thought I could have played another couple of seasons, you know, it was nice if we are going to finish, that we finished on the same day. Lovely. You couldn't get away from him. <laughs> um, uh, you, you know what? Just like last time, you've kind of already approached the topic itself. But uh, I guess to kind of talk about Norwich uh, as a kind of a wider point of where we are today um, and specifically uh, the players coming through. Now, just to take, for example, obviously someone who, you know, you've had previous um, kind of coaching uh, with as well in terms of Todd Cantwell. What's it like seeing a, a homegrown talent like that come through, you know, the 16s, 18s, 23s? break into that first team and have such a successful start with the club and then also, you know, be introduced into the England setup. You know, I'm, I'm sure with the way he's playing at the minute, it's not far before he gets that first team call, but what's it like for you to kind of know that, you know, in some aspect you've watched that or played a role in that player becoming who he is? Yeah, it's not just Todd. You've got, you've got Max as well. You know, Adam Ida, uh, Jamal Lewis, who's already gone. It's great to be around it. And, you know, the, the, the coaches were around at the time. I've got to take a, you know, a tiny bit of credit for it. But, you know, you've got to... Really, it's it's down to the players. You know, you, you've got to have a, a sporting director who, who builds and tries to, to get youth players in. You've got to have a manager who trusts the players and has got the courage to play them and give them a chance. But it is always, always down to the player. You know, the players... They get two or three chances to state their claim. And if they're not good enough, they get pushed by the way, wayside and then someone else has a go. So Max Aarons, Todd Cantwell, people like that, they deserve, deserve massive credit, not only to get in the first team, but prove they deserve to be there and then prove you're one of the best players in the league. And I think Max Aarons has proved he's the best right back in the league. And with Emi Buendia, Todd Cantwell is one of the best attacking midfielders in the league. Got to keep being consistent. But, I, you know, I, I still speak to Toddy quite a bit. I still speak to Max quite a bit. They already, or, always know that I'm here for any advice they, they want from me. Because, you know, I'll just tell them the truth. I told them the truth when they were under 15. I told them the truth when they were under 18s. I tell them the truth if they're doing something wrong. I'll just tell them. So, you know, they, they know that always, I'm always there if they need that kind of help. But the... It's always the players. Players have to kick on themselves. They have to prove they're worthy of that level. Because if it wasn't, if it was the coaches, then every player that come for a youth team would, would play professionally and play at the top level. And it just don't work like that. So, you know, the, the coaches deserve a tiny bit of credit, but the players are the ones who have to prove it week in, week out. And you know, let's face it, they've been exceptional over the last three years. While we're on the, the current side, um, I suppose this, this might be a, a bit of a difficult question. You might want to swerve it, but how uh, confident are you that they're going to be promoted now? Truthfully, I've been very confident from about 16, 17 games in. Just because, you know, we've all seen all the other teams in the league. And if I'm brutally honest, there's two or three good teams in this league. I'm going to be, I don't think the standards very been that great this year. And I do believe that we are head and shoulders the best team and as the best squad in this league. Through, you know, we've picked up the right type of players, we've added when we've needed to, and we've kept three or four of the best young players in the, in, especially in this league, but maybe in the country. So you know, it's all going well at the minute. We've just got to finish the job off now. Seven points clear, 14 games to go. It's in our hands. You know, we'd be uh, devastated if we didn't get top two in this position. I know you've kind of already spoke about the, the the you know array of talent we have right now at our disposal, but are there any specific players that you watch and you think, oh, what if I had a an Emmy Wendier when I was playing? Or, you know, are there any kind of players that you just wish you got the chance to play with now? Uh, don't get me wrong; it'd be nice to play with Emma. He's a good player. Uh, I think Puki scores goals. You know, wh whichever level he's played at, he scored goals. One of the biggest things this season, and they probably don't get as much credit as they probably deserve, is how good the defence and the goalkeeper and skip's been. Oh. You know, 
we are, um, in my belief, we are a much more complete team this time around than we were when we won the league two years ago, just because we're much better defensively. Much, much better defensively. We can win games, like you say, we've won a lot of games this year by one goal. With one nil wins and two one wins, but that, you know, that wouldn't have happened two years ago because we were vulnerable at the back. So I do think this year we've we've been solid all the way through. I think Skip's been outstanding. Outstanding. He does all the stuff that uh, players don't want to do to make our better attacking players look good. He's been he's been exceptional, Skip has. But you've also got two hard and centre arts and you've got the best goalkeeper in the division. So we, we ain't doing too bad, are we? Hi, no. <laughs> I think, well, when, when you mentioned Skip, the, the thing that came to my mind was uh, quite a lot of people are talking about how we might not ever see him or the large majority of Norwich fans may not ever see him in the shirt in real life. Um, and it just got me thinking, do you think your game would have suffered? Uh, and I put in my, uh, in my piece a couple of weeks ago that you were the, the most exciting player that we ever had. Do you think your game would have suffered without fans in the, in the stadium? Uh, I, I don't think so. Because I was just playing against the right back. So it was basically, no, <laughs> don't get me wrong, it's nice when the, the fans are there and they spur you on and it's, they, they give you a lift. But at the end of the day, it's 1v1. It's me against whoever I'm playing against. And I'm pretty sure I've seen a lot of teams this year they wouldn't have been able to cope with me at full, at full weight. I just don't believe that. I think I'd have ripped into bits. And that's the honest truth. So, obviously, it's nice when fans are there. But I don't know like, about you, but I've, known, I've watched enough every game Norwich have played this season. So, even though the fans aren't there at home, we have got to watch a lot of Norwich City this year. I know it's not in person, but there's a lot of football on TV. And you know, I've, I think I've watched every single Norwich game this season which you don't often get that unless, unless, unless you travel home and away. So I would say that's been a positive. But obviously, as soon as the fans, we can get them back in, the better. But like I say, I think a lot of people have you know, seen how well we've played and not just how well we've played, but how much grit and determination, how much, uh, how hard to beat we've been. How, how we've stood, stood up to the fight of the championship because the championship's a tough league. So you know, it's, been, it's been a good watch this season so far. I guess to take it back and look at kind of Norwich as a, as a general view in terms of in history, we just wanted to get your, your view on your ideal five-a-side team. Now, this can be any formation you'd like, um, and it can be players you played with, maybe players that I like we spoke to earlier that you maybe wish you played with or, you know, before your time at Norwich. But, you know, what, what would be your dream five-a-side? Feel free to put yourself in too. <laughs> Just wait, well, I'm, I'm the first pick. That's not... What's... <laughs> I'm going to go, okay, I'm going to go players I've played with, I think. Okay. Players I've played with. Uh, five sides. So we've got in goal, got to go Rob Green. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic Rob goalkeeper. Green, yeah, he was the best goalkeeper I've played with at Norwich by a country mile, to be honest with you. Uh, defensive. Defence, I'm going to go Adam Drury, 100%. Especially if I'm sorry, he ain't going to do anything, he's got to stay back. <laughs> <laughs> Just run around. <laughs> yeah. I want to put Holt, uh, Gary Holt in, but I'm not going to. I'm going to put uh, Yusuf Safri in there. Oh, yeah. Score from anywhere on the pitch. Then I'm going to put myself as a free roll. I go where I want. And then I've got one more on it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. One more. Yeah. Oh, I'd, I'd love to put Robbo in, but I don't think Robbo's game was five aside. You and Robertson need to be as a target man. He's, he's not about movement. So I'm going to put another one who was an exceptional player and his career was cut ridiculously short for injury. I'm going to put Dean Ashton. Yeah, I was, I was expecting an Ashton or a, or a Dion Dublin maybe sneaking his way in there. but uh... <laughs> Dion, Dion, Dion's like uh, Ewan. He's not really a five aside player. <laughs> not really a five. Don't get me wrong, good players, but they're they're more of a eight side, eleven side kind of kind of players. They, they need to be smashing up against people and holding the ball up and bringing the people in. So that would be my uh, five side team. 
I think it's really interesting that you chose Yusuf Safri. Oh, I really wasn't expecting that. What what made you pick him? He was just an excellent all round footballer. Had a bit of a nasty streak in him. Great range of passing. Uh, really technical. Uh, I think that was one of the reasons why Peter Grant's little reign fell to bits because it was, we sell, we we got rid of Yusuf Safra, Dixon Atu, and Robert Earnshaw in about a week. So I don't think you can take if you're a manager and you lose three of your best players, you've got no chance, have you? Does Earnshaw get any get close to your striker position in the five side team? Uh, and he's a real good player, real good finisher. But he's what is. I think Dean Ashton was better at bringing other people into the game. I think Dean Ashton was more of a complete centre forward. Ernie was just an unbelievably good, good finisher. Played on the shoulder, but you know he, he didn't really win any others. Didn't really hold the ball. Didn't really bring anybody else in. He was, he was more of a clinical striker, really. So uh, Dean Ashton was much more complete player. Awesome. Amazing. Well, I think that's probably on the door 30 minutes as it is anyway, I'm sure. But uh, You want to be careful, yeah. get told off if you're not. <laughs> Thank you so much, man, for, for, you know, giving us your time and, and, you know, answering our questions and stuff. It's been a pleasure to speak to you, especially as, you know, um, someone who grew up with, I mean, it was quite ideal because when you were number six, it was with my small kids' shirts, it was anyone that would actually be able to fit on there. I'm glad you didn't pick 11 or something because I wouldn't have been able to get both the numbers on. But, uh it's a pleasure speaking yeah, to actually, you. Only, only got six because it was either six or 24. So I wanted to go old school and stay in the one to 11. I'm glad for my sake. <laughs> if not, I'd had Huckabee with no number on it. <laughs> they, actually tried, they actually tried to make me change it to number seven in the Premier League year. But, yeah. But I, I didn't said, well, everyone, well, I said everyone's already bought number six. So I just thought it was, uh... a, bit of a, I thought, I thought it was a bit of a cash grab. So I, I just said, no, I'll just stay, I'll just stay number six. Amazing. Fair enough. I, don't, I think I would have switched, but you know. Well, oh, number seven, seven number seven was my number at Man City and at uh, Coventry. So it would have been easy for me to change it, but I thought, no, all the people have already paid for number six. So I would have been really disappointed. Oh, I would have. I would have been absolutely fuming. I'll say that for a fad, but <laughs> oh, no. But, uh, but yeah, thank you so much again.